Now I want to talk about partial evidence. So far we have considered only the case where a random variable was completely unknown. I mean, you might know something about it because you know something about another variable because B is instantiated, for example. Um, but otherwise, nothing is known about a variable A, let's say. Or it is instantiated, which means it has a concrete value, so we know everything that we can know about that variable for that instantiation or that sample. Now partial evidence means that we know a bit about that variable but it's not instantiated. For instance, consider the case of a, of a die again. So we have a variable A which is the number of the die that we roll and it can assume the values 1 to 6 and the probability of these values is um, 1 over 6 is 1 6 because it's the same for all 6 possible values. Now if I tell you I've rolled my die and it is an even number uh, then you know it can't be 1, 3 and 5 but it still may be 2, 4 and 6. That is partial evidence. So I know a bit about the variable but not its concrete value meaning from the possible values some are excluded but there's still some left. No? So if we do this here, if we simply exclude the values that we know that the die can't have, we are left with a 3 times 1 over 6. Uh, still we would assume that the probability of 2, 4 and 6 is equal but it's not 1 over 6 anymore because that would violate the normalization condition. Right? If you sum over that you would only get 1 half. So you have to renormalize the values and then you get one third for these three values. So if I roll a die, I don't show you the number, but I tell you it's an even number, then you would guess it's either two, four, and three with equal probability one third. And that what happens if you have partial evidence of a variable. The na notation is P of A for a variable where you have no evidence and this um, calligraphic E sub A is represents the partial evidence. It's a set of values that are still possible for A. In this case, calligraphic E of uh, sub A would be 2, 4, and 6. And then the probabilities of A given that evidence is 0 because you know it's an even number. 1 third, 0, 1 third, 0, 1 third. I've sort of invented this notation as an intermediate step where I simply discard those values that are not possible. Uh, given the partial evidence, but I leave the values P of A intact, right? It's the same values as here, but it's sort of masked by the values, uh, by the partial evidence. No? So a way you could write this, it's P of A, given the partial evidence, equals P of A normalized by the sum of the probabilities of those values that are still possible, so A dash goes over all possible values given the partial evidence, and it's zero otherwise. Or for short, I will write P of A given the evidence is P of A divided by, so renormalized by the sum over the probabilities of those values that are still possible, and I just take for granted that the statement that it is zero otherwise. Okay. Now this is the equation if you have just one variable. Again this generalizes to multiple variables. So if you have P of A, B given partial evidence of A and B, that would mean you take the original probabilities and you normalize it by the sum over the probabilities of all those pairs of values that are still possible given the partial evidence. So in this case the set calligraphic E A B would be a set of pairs of values A and B and you go through all these pairs that are still possible, you normal, renormalize it by, uh, by that so that if you would sum this fraction or this thing here over all values of A and B it would be 1 again. Right? And again with the understanding that the value of this is zero if A and B are not in the evidence set.
To simplify matters a bit, we I will usually assume that the evidence is independent for the two variables, meaning I can write EAB as EA, EB, and then the sum would simply go over all values of A that are still possible and all values of B that are still possible. We can derive similar equations as before with partial evidence. So for instance, if this joint probability P of A, B, given the evidence for A and B is given, we can calculate the marginal probability over A by simply summing over all values of uh, of B, so summing P of A, B over all values of B. So this is a simple uh, equation that we had before, equation number two above. Um, okay, and if we now plug in this equation here, for this one here, uh, that results in this expression. Yeah. So we simply plug in P of A, B divided by the sum for this one here. And since the denominator is simply constant, we can put the sum here at the top. Which then is this one here, so the sum over B within the evidence set of P of A and B, normalized by this denominator. Similarly, for conditional probabilities, we can take the normal equation, which is P of B given A equals P of A B divided by P of A, but now we add all the partial evidence, and now we substitute this term here for this part and this term here for this part. And that gives this complicated looking uh, fraction, but this denominator is the same as this denominator. So these two cancel out and we are left with P of A, B divided by the sum over P of A, B, over the possible values within the evidence set. Expectation values. Now that's an important concept in, in uh, Bayesian theory. Uh, it's the value that you would expect on average if you sample from a variable very often. It's written in different versions, so either as E of, now in curly brackets, A, and that's the expectation value, or A bar, which indicates the average value, or the notation that I will use, these pointy brackets, which indicate an averaging over A. In either case, it is the average or it's the weighted sum of the values A, weighted with the probability that you get that value. Right? Mm. So let me give you an example. I mean, it's quite obvious, I guess, but if a random variable can take the, can assume the value is 3 and 7, and it does so, with the probability, let's say, with the equal probability, one half, one half, you simply add these two, and that gives you three plus seven is ten divided by two would give you five, right? Which is the average value between three and seven. Now let's see what happens if we put 4 here and a 3 quarter here. So in this case the 7 is, is drawn 3 times more, f more often than the 3. Mm, okay, so we could do 3 times 7, 21 plus 3, 24. Uh, divided by 4, which would be 6. 
right? Good. Um, now this is simply the average the, or the expectation value or the mean value, the average value of the random variable itself. Very often we are looking for random uh, the expectation value of the function of the random variable. In that case we would write the average of f of a over a and that's simply defined as the weighted average over the function values of a, which will be different for the different values of a, multi weighted by the probability of getting a. So that's, I, I guess it's all pretty straightforward. Um, you can also take expectation values for more than two, uh, more than one random variable. For example, we could have a function that depends on two random variables a and b. And then the average would simply be um, the sum of all values a and b of f of a and b multiplied with the probability of a and b. Um, yeah, wait, that's pretty straightforward. But now we can do, um, we can split p of a b into an p of a given b times p of b, as we have seen before. And then we can rearrange the sums a little bit because this p of b does not depend on a so we can take this out of the sum over a so we have an inner sum over a over f of a and b times p of a given b and then we have an outer average over b and this in a shorthand notation would be written like this so we have the inner average over a given b and then the outer average over b and of course we can switch this around so we can write p of a b as p of b given a times p of a and then we can take p of a out and we have the inner sum over b and the outer sum over a. What we will use quite often is the fact that the expectation value or the averaging or mean value is a linear operation and that means if we scale the function that we average over by some factor gamma can take this gamma out and scale the average of f of a with this scaling factor. Or if we have a sum of two functions that we average over, we can that's equal to the sum of the averages or the sum of the expectation values. And that's simply a consequence of the sum being a linear operation. continuous random variables. So far we have considered only discrete random variables, like the numbers that we can roll with a with a die, which would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, random variables can also be continuous, like let's say the height of a person uh, or the weight of a person. So that is not discrete, that's continuous uh, value. And pretty much everything goes through with the continuous values by substituting sums by integrals. For example, the normalization rule becomes this rule, so the integral over x of p of x dx should be 1. Um, or the marginal distribution can be calculated as p of x equals the integral over y of p of x y dy and the base rule still applies and also the expectation rule applies by simply replacing the sum by the integral. Now even though on a formal level it's not su such a big issue, there are some strange things going on with um, with probability densities. Um, So one thing is, if we imagine we have a probability density, 
something like this. Oh, sorry, and this is X. And this is P of X. So this normalization rule tells us that the integral over this area is 1. Now, if you imagine that this distribution goes from, I don't know, goes from something like zero point three to zero point four. Then it's quite obvious that in order to make this area um, one, you need something like a value of I don't know. This is one. Maybe a value of ten here. Yeah. And that means that in contrast to probab probabilities that may never be larger than one. In the continuous case, we have something that we call probability density, and that may well be greater than 1. So probability density can have very large values if the range of values is correspondingly small. So still we have this normalization condition that the area must be 1, but if the range in this direction is small, then the value of the probability density can be much larger than 1. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other thing is that you should be clear about when you talk about probabilities and one about prob when you talk about probability densities. As I said, probabilities can never be larger than 1. They have to be between 0 and 1, while probability densities can be much larger than 1. Um, and if you want to make a statement about probabilities, you always have to make a statement about an interval. So it does not make sense um, to say, to ask what, what's the probability that, a, that x has a certain value? Because that's always zero, right? I mean, the, the, there's an infinitely many different values here, and if you sample from this distribution, and you ask the question, okay, so what's the probability that I get a value of exactly 0 0.35, which would be in the middle here, then you can sample forever, right? If you just look at the value that you have sampled close enough at some point after the, maybe after, at some position after the point, there will be a, a difference between 0 0.35 and the value that, that you've just sampled. So you have zero chance of sampling a value exactly 0 0.35. But what you can reasonably ask is, what's the probability that a value lies within a certain range? Right? And that's shown down here. So if we illustrate this here, that would be for instance this one if you ask the question, okay, what's the probability that the value lies within that range here? Now then what you would integrate over that area. And that is a finite thing. Huh? And you can imagine if you if you make these closer to, together, if you move these two the interval the borders of the interval are closer together so that in the end you arrive at the question, okay, what's the what's the probability that you get exactly this value? Then you would integrate from x1 to x1, from the same, from one value to the same value, and then obviously the integral would be zero.